Uh, well, yeah, since it's the odd one, I guess I go first. Yes, yeah, you're the odd one. Yes, I am. You are too. Why, well, thank you. <laughs> This is Control Structure, episode 155, for May 7th, 2019. We hope you had a happy Sicko de Mayo. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs155 to see them. Uh, I am Andrew Bailey, and joining me this week is Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Steve. So, did you have a happy Sicko de Mayo? Sicko de Mayo. I actually didn't know that that was happened this time, but yes, I suppose I did, probably. Yeah. What was yours? Uh, well, I went out and rode my bicycle for like 25 miles, and uh, on the uh, T, both to and from, I saw the Mexican uh, grocery store having a little festival. Oh wait, there's a Mexican grocery store here? Yes! Oh, I should uh, uh, see that sometime, huh? Yeah, it's like five blocks up if you like follow the T tracks. Nice! Yeah. It's, it's not a restaurant, it's, it's a, a grocery, grocery store. store. Kind of like the, the Indian grocery store I went through once. It was kind of neat seeing what the, the official ethnic Indian foods and stuff, what they actually had in the grocery store. Yeah. So, Microsoft? 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 Microsoft! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's a little unusual. But, hey, they're having their build conference shindig, and we've already got some goodies. So, uh, Windows is getting a new terminal. It's all GPU accelerated and stuff. It's cool because you can see through it. Yes, it's transparent it, with transparent emoji. If, yes, yes, with emojis. So now I can name my files with smiley faces and delete smiley faces and things like that. Yep, so it is GPU accelerated text rendering and like Pretty much, uh, they say they want to elevate the command line user experience on Windows. Why do I feel like some Linux distros had translucent terminals for like a long time? Uh, because they have. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really add that much to the experience. But now you can have it in PowerShell. Oh, so much better. <laughs> but, uh, hey, speaking about, uh, command lines and everything, uh, you mentioned Linux there. Um... Oh yeah, by the way, they also, you know, along with open sourcing everything, they also open source the terminal. Uh, but hey, back to Linux. Um, turns out that uh, Windows is getting a Linux kernel uh, because of the, uh, they're updating their Windows subsystem for Linux thing. And apparently that involves like having a component for Windows that is essentially the Linux kernel. It's interesting they're saying that, that they're going to make a point of making sure they merge back any fixes they do back to the kernel so that someday they won't really have custom mods and things to make this work with Windows that will just be like the default kernel. So that's, that's neat that they have that uh, mentality behind them. So, yeah, open source is eating the world, even Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, one of the articles was saying that that was how they are getting that. There may have been this one, perhaps that they just hired people that were into open source and familiar with Linux, and that was why it was becoming a thing in Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft employs a growing number of Linux contributors who have brought industry-leading uh, Linux know-how into the company. So, and uh, like I guess they originally started this due to their uh, Azure uh, service thing, uh, that uh, you know uh, Microsoft was going to people and they're like, hey, we want you to use our new service, our uh, cloud computing service thing. It's like, we want you to move your stuff over there. It's like, okay, uh, you know, you support Windows, obviously. Uh, we have a few Linux systems. Like, I don't think you exactly do Linux, do you? <laughs> so, and well, here we are, I guess. Uh, so now that the start menu is back, we love you, start menu. <laughs> It's getting its own special process. It's no longer going to be part of the Explorer process. Do you know what the best part is about having it as its own process? You can kill it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if you really want to mess with uh, people, uh, like if you don't want people messing with your uh, computer all that much... <laughs> <laughs> you can just kill the start menu process, and then when they're clicking, uh, your computer's not working. I'd, I'd reboot it, but I can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can't click start to click shut down. <laughs> you can't start to stop. <laughs> you know, I never thought of it that way. I mean, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Remember the whole thing? Was that Windows 10 when... No, it was 8 when no one could figure out how to shut the computer down. Like, I like I was one of the guys that had to Google how to shut down the computer. Like, I remember that was a thing. Everyone had to Google how do you shut down your computer. And then, like, you had to swipe in from the other side and uh, for that charm thing. I forget. It was just weird. I remember... The, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Python. Uh, we love Python, right? Like snakes and... Uh, no, okay. Not critter Python. Uh, programming Python. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I don't exactly think you like the other kind of Python. Not really, actually. Okay. So, uh, uh, let's see. Visual Studio Code. Uh, I'm gonna really have to check this out now, uh, because they just updated their Python extension to that. So now you can go in and do all sorts of fancy debugging and stuff. It looks like they showed the variables and stuff when you're debugging, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot better than uh, that uh, that debugging that you can do in idle. You know, that, uh, that little IDE sort of that comes with Python. Uh, see, I never used the, those kind of side IDE, IDEs. I just did the pure form in the terminal. <laughs> So, yeah, idle is, like, not too far of a step from that, honestly. <laughs> okay. Like, it doesn't even have, like, a tree with, like, all of your files and mm. your folder or anything. It doesn't even do that. Code's really good. It's going places. Like, Microsoft's doing a super good job on it. Just the extensions that you can do anything with it. So, uh, hopefully with this, I will be able to update my uh, uh, Tea Time app. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Which, uh... You know, does uh, the timetables for uh, mass transit systems. So, uh, you know, like I, I was messing around with it, uh, I want to say like maybe two months ago or so, maybe a month ago. Uh, and uh, like I was running into uh, a few issues because like I hadn't touched it in like a year or so. So I kind of forgot how I had structured the data out. And like I had, had uh, like made a few tweaks in order to support uh, multi-processing, and like it suddenly fell apart. Mm -hmm. So like I wasn't exactly sure how, and like the debugger in idle kind of sucks when you have like multi-nested classes like inside of each other. Oh, uh, okay. So yes, I will definitely have to uh, make it a point to check this out, which I actually already have it installed. There you go. Uh, yeah. Visual Studio Code. There we go. No time at all you'd be working away in .NET. Well, you say that. <laughs> what do you have for me? <laughs> well, speaking of .NET, did you know that after .NET Core 3 comes out, that the next version will be .NET, .NET Core 4? .NET 5. .NET Core 5? No, .NET 5. Five. Really? Yes. Like, are you sure it's it's not dot net framework five? No, no, no. It's just dot net five. Wow. So, uh, like, I I guess I've been totally out of the dot uh, net ecosystem for a while, or rather, the dot net framework ecosystem, uh, because like, wasn't that their thing? Mm -hmm. And so now it's the Microsoft has figured that it would be more simple and. More clear if instead of having the .NET Framework, which is no longer supported, and .NET Core, which is the next up-and-coming thing, they're going to merge them into one, and they drop Core off, and they drop the word Framework off, and increment the version to 5, so you get .NET 5, which is supported on Mac iOS, uh, let's see, Mac OS, iOS, Android, tvOS, watchOS, WebAssembly, and Windows and Linux. So, quite good oh, support. Oh, you you had me worried there. I didn't. I wasn't sure if it was on Windows or not. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's more suspenseful to wait till the end. <laughs> so this this is sort of like a uh, you know it's pretty much a breath of clarity in here uh, compared to like 15 years ago. You remember how many editions Windows Vista came in? There was like oh, 10 yes. or 20 or something. I remember that. There was. <laughs> Home basic, home premium, professional, and like all this other kinds of stuff. Uh, so yeah, they've simple they've simplified it up quite a bit. 
Uh, unfortunately, it seems like the guys who were in charge of that naming scheme went over to the USB people and started messing up all their naming schemes. That explains it. <laughs> yeah, the neat thing about this is just the, the support of everything, and if it's the standard going forwards, that just opens up uh, a lot of cross-compatibility with Linux so, and things like that. So the sort of timetable on this, uh, they're saying that .NET Core 3... Uh, will be out in uh, this September, uh, followed by 3.1, and then .NET 5 will be November 2020. That simplifies a lot of things, so hey, if I want to get into uh, .NET development... Uh, you have Visual Studio Code, you may as well install the runtime too yeah. for the SDK. But uh, I wonder how well it will do with Java. I'm sure there's something out there for like, it. Like maybe Java Enterprise Edition. There you go. Like the thing that apparently Oracle uh, sort of sort of handed off to the Eclipse Foundation, but not really. Like apparently that's like in sort of like a bad place right now. Uh, because according to the recent board minutes of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, Oracle wanted to have uh, a set of unacceptable demands for the... Uh, a uh, handover of uh, Java and Java EE and everything. Uh, some of them would put the existence of the Eclipse Foundation at risk. Oracle claimed that products distributed by the Eclipse Foundation, such as the Eclipse IDE itself, uh, must only be bundled with Java runtimes certified particularly by Oracle and its licensees. No other vendor certification and not any uncertified runtime. Thus, the Eclipse IDE and even Glassfish would not be vendor neutral products anymore. Uh, this restriction was not uh, present at the start of negotiations, and it was introduced much later while the transfer was already in progress. I'm not sure how they could apply that retroactively. Uh, one could assume that reaction was in donation to IBM's J9 JVM donated to the Eclipse Foundation, which is a clear threat to Oracle. But once Eclipse products would not be vendor neutral anymore, the foundation's tax exemption might become void, which would mean a big financial mess, possibly the end of the organization. Uh, thus, it was not only unacceptable, but simply impossible to agree to Oracle's requests, so the negotiations have more or less failed. It feels like Oracle's kind of been having troubles lately. Like, they just... Things they're doing yeah. and stuff, they're not yeah, they're, on a good track. Yeah, they're more like, no one can play with our toys. Uh-huh. You know? So, maybe after all of this, we can all move to .NET 5 instead? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, let's talk about something else. No script. Uh, have you ever... Are you using no script? I don't think so. Okay. I know you use NoScript, and uh, so nothing ever works when we send you a link. Like, the pages look totally different, because... <laughs> well, I used to use NoScript. Uh, I use Umatrix now. Oh, okay. But NoScript was still pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, it's a great extension for Firefox, and now it's a great extension for Chrome, uh, because it's finally been released for Chrome. Uh, so this port essentially started when... Firefox moved to the web extensions uh, model for like all their add-ons and everything. So, uh, you know, people have been saying, it's like, okay, well, since Chrome supports this API as well, let's, you know, move that over. And that's finally uh, passed everything. Uh, there's only one feature that uh, has to be left out, uh, which I think it's... Uh, uh, like some kind of XSS auditor, which uh, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but uh, you know, like that's hardly the main feature of NoScript. So essentially, like it blocks JavaScript and uh, potentially a few other things on a per domain basis. Um, so yeah, this is a pretty good way to eliminate some ads on your web pages. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's officially in the store. So, talking about extensions, uh, Mozilla will uh, begin, uh, let's see, yeah, will decide, well decide, has decided to delete and ban Firefox extensions that ship only obfuscated code. So, like code that's essentially like all mixed up and you can't really read it too well. Uh, that's those submissions will apparently no longer be accepted by 
uh, the official add-on site uh, because apparently they noticed that extensions that only have obfuscated code are more or less malware. <laughs> so if you're trying to hide it that hard, why? Yeah, like you're you're up to something. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have you. So uh, that's not going to happen until June. But I thought it would was happening a lot sooner because uh, let's see, do you use Firefox? I think I you're use using Chrome. There. Fire, well, I'm using Chrome here because Google has specifically made changes that affect the performance of Firefox in Google Docs and things like that. Mm-hmm. I read an article about that recently. Google went out of their way to make Firefox not work as good. Anyways, I normally use Firefox, though. Yes. So, uh, did you happen to be using Firefox this weekend? I was not using the computer much this okay. weekend, but... Uh, due to the fencing, probably. Due to the fencing and <laughs> things like that, yes. Uh, Various things, so, planting trees and... So, Friday afternoon-ish, uh, suddenly everyone's Firefox extensions stopped working. Uh, so, I'm like, uh, are they enforcing this already? Like, have they gone into my browser and deleted everything? It's like, you can't have those. <laughs> You're not like, allowed. So clicked around. No, they're still there. It's just Firefox says that, uh, like, they're not signed or anything. It's like, okay, that's weird. I thought they did that a while ago. Well, it turns out the certificate that they used to sign extensions expired on Friday. Uh, so that means no extensions were working. Uh, so after a little bit back and forth, they finally released a patch, uh, I think it was Sunday, like later on Sunday. Uh, so yeah, now your password managers are working, your no scripts working, your U matrix is working, uh, your everything is working now. And so probably all the ad sites got a big bump for just like a day or so. They're like, well, this is great. <laughs> Suddenly a lot more people are using Firefox right now. <laughs> So, yeah, it turns out breaking your browser is pretty popular. (laughs) So, uh, now, granted, you know, I see ads slip in here and there with the U-Matrix. It's not too bad. Mm. Uh, I did see a lot more ads, but uh, not as much as I would have because I have Pi-Hole running here. So, uh, again, you know, they've been mandating uh, signature or rather... uh, uh, signatures on extensions since Firefox 43 uh, back in December 2015. So, like, how no one set a calendar reminder for this is sort of neglectful. Whoops. Yeah, you did this to yourselves, Mozilla. So, speaking about uh, Firefox, you remember how it killed uh, Internet Explorer back in the day? Like, Oh, when the big, big change happened. I actually remember uh, on the news... Uh, them talking about browsers and like listing Firefox as one of the alternatives. To I remember that. So, uh, back in the latter days of Internet Explorer six, so like two thousand nine or so, uh, that uh, apparently some kind of uh, I wouldn't exactly say rogue team at YouTube, just a few people who, after the uh, buyout. You know, after Google bought YouTube out, you know, still retained, you know, essentially the keys to the kingdom that, you know, essentially allowed them to bypass any kind of code reviews or anything. Uh, when, you know, someone finally decided they did, that they would, ha- they, that they had enough of supporting IE6 and decided to put a little message box, uh, that would only appear to Internet Explorer 6 people that, uh, says, hey, uh, your browser's kind of old, please upgrade. Um, and so, like, pretty much sent it on through, and pretty much the next day, you know, like, uh, media, you know, like, the uh, tech media was all over this. It's like, you know, finally, YouTube is trying to kill Internet Explorer 6. And then, like, later on the same day, the people over at Google Docs said, uh, hey, YouTube's doing this, maybe we should too. <laughs> So that essentially started the snowball snowball that killed IE6. It's funny how the once they started it, it's like everyone was doing it because everyone else was doing it. 
And so it just became a thing. And so they actually got away with it because these guys kind of thought they might get fired or something. Yeah. They just kept waiting for the hammer to come. They didn't actually get hammered. Now, granted, the lawyers came around, but that was because uh, by random, the uh, uh, the random number generator uh, said that Chrome should be listed first for them. But they're like, hey... Uh, the guy said, hey, this is like randomized on a per user basis. It's not always going to be Chrome that's first. So like, you know, he like ran some tests and showed them, okay, it's different each time. And then they like chilled, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the things that's like, okay, well, this is kind of risky doing this. <laughs> and, then, and then it gets put out there. They're like, hey, they're doing that. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> suddenly it was buffer for everyone to do. It was interesting reading the article, some of the pain that they had. Like they talked about the image tag, and if they set the source to empty, it would basically turn it an iframe and then recursively loop into their domain and mess things up. <laughs> so it was just, it was definitely a problem. I know, remember way back when when I did some website stuff, the IE was always the toughest thing to make anything compatible with. Yeah. But, uh,. Good thing is Microsoft finally got their act together. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, and they switched to Chrome. Well, uh, Chromium, anyway, <laughs> more or less. They got their act together and deleted IE and used Chrome instead. <laughs> uh, well, there there is an uh, article I almost put in here that says, uh, like, even though they're moving to the new Chromium mm -hmm. engine, that they're still going to have an IE eleven mode in the new Edge. IE 11 mode? Yes. What is IE 11? Always oh, for compatibility. Yes. Okay. Which I think is probably a bad idea. Like, if you need IE 11 compatibility, why don't you just have IE 11? Yeah. I'm assuming that's probably for businesses, but... Oh, yeah, It's definitely. interesting. Yeah. Ah. So, uh, why don't we talk about games for a while? Okay. Yeah. You know, get, get uh, past all this, you know, depressing web stuff. Uh, so Epic Games uh, has, is buying Psyonix, which is the studio behind Rocket League, which is essentially, uh, well, their previous iteration of Rocket League was something like Rocket Powered Battle Cars or something. It's essentially a soccer a soccer game, but instead of people, you have rocket cars. Rocket cars, cars. okay. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, like they, you know, give give uh, you know the normal corporate speak of, oh yeah, we're so excited about this, blah blah blah. Uh, everyone else is having a collective freakout uh, that now that Epic owns them. Well, Epic has this Epic Game Store, you see, that is trying to uh, promote uh, pretty excessively. Uh, so that includes going to uh, other people uh, and saying, hey. Uh, if you have your game only on our store, we'll give you like a few million dollars. <laughs> so uh, the idea is, okay, they bought out a game developer and maybe they want this just to promote their game store. So they're going to take it down from Steam, which means like everyone who's bought it on Steam, they're kind of SOL'd. Uh, so mm -hmm. whether they're going to do that is unclear. They have said that they will still support the game on Steam for everyone who already has it already right now. Has it, yeah, uh, you kind of have to do that much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like, you can still if it, if you if you have it in your account, the idea is you can still download it. And like any more DLC that comes out, you'll have that. Uh, it's unclear if they will still offer it for sale. I can't just help but think of one time with World of Tanks. For an April, April Fool's update, they actually had soccer mode where you could drive in and like push the soccer ball around. Like it was like a soccer game with other tank players, and you could shoot the ball and stuff. Like that was really fun, actually. You know, with all this uh, stuff about Epic taking games off of Steam, they're not in much of a hurry to take their own games off of Steam because you can still get the Unreal games mm -hmm. on Steam. So. Like, whether or not that uh, they will pull down Rocket League, who knows? Then again, Unreal is kind of an old game right now. So, you know, like, I I would think that Rocket League would be po more popular than all of these put together. But mm, That could be a bigger target. But who knows? Hopefully, 
They will cooperate and not be jerks. Uh, Ubisoft, uh, another competing game publisher, also operating a game store, says that uh, they want to stop the unauthorized uh, selling of uh, game keys. They've essentially hatched a plan where, like, instead of distributing game keys out to each individual store and trying to make them cooperate in, like, you know, all the sales and everything, that instead uh, the store uh, will ask customers for their Uplay account. Then when they buy it, they will tell Ubisoft to add this game to this account, uh, which, I mean, seems like a pretty, you know, solid idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so with this, you know, like there's no kind of black market for video game keys. It was interesting that in there they were mentioning that sometimes the retailers could kind of cheat and, uh, like, if there was a special for 30% off, they could uh, tell them, oh, yeah, we sold a bunch of games when that sale was on, but really some of those were sold when the sale wasn't on, so then the retailer would get money back that wasn't actually uh, legit. Yeah. So, uh, let's move on to Blizzard. So, Blizzard has their own game convention uh, that, you know, they've apparently already had one batch of tickets posted for sale and, you know, they s sell out almost immediately. Um, apparently they're requiring people to install a very invasive smartphone app. Like, we're talking about Facebook levels of invasiveness and spying here. Um, so, uh, apparently printed tickets will not be a thing. And, uh, you know, there's also an article about this uh, app. It's called, like, a AXS. Um, so here's a brief overview of all the information that can be collected uh, from just the mobile app alone, nearly all of which is there shared with third parties without being anonymized or aggregated. First and last name. Precise location. Determined by GPS, Wi-Fi, and other means. How often the app is used. What content is viewed in the app which ads are clicked, what purchases are made, a user's personal advertising identifier, IP address, operating system, device, make and model, billing address, security code, mailing address, phone number, email address, and credit card number, along with many others. And they will share all this information with a laundry list of advertisers, marketers, unknown, quote, clients, and third-party services, including, but not limited to, Google, DoubleClick Ads, Facebook, and whoever else the company feels like deserves this personal information. Uh, we reserve the right to share your personal information with our current or future affiliated entity, subsidiaries, and parent companies, uh, says the privacy policy. We may also share your personal information and other information with trusted third parties, like our sponsors, partners, and or their affiliates and subsidiaries and other related entities for marketing, advertising, or other commercial purposes, and we may occasionally allow third parties to access sites for marketing purposes. So they can do what they want to do without asking you. Pretty much. Because, like, they asked you when you installed the app. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, broken down, and uh, so Blizzard is like, you know, if, if there's some kind of problem... Uh, just go over to our support desk and, you know, presumably you will have to log into your AXS account over there to prove that, yes, I did buy a ticket for this. And then they'll pretty much scrap the thing and give you, like, a paper badge to, like, wow. win a, in a lanyard or something. So, uh, yeah, good job on that. <laughs> Not that I, you know, like, that's all, all the way out in California. <laughs> like, I've, I've never been out to one of those. Um, although I think I've been to a venue that later hosted it. Uh, hey, uh, Commodore 64, remember that old thing? Uh, I've seen pictures. Yeah, because uh, you had that Atari 800 or 600 or something? We figured out what it was the one time. Yeah. Uh, so the Commodore 64 kernel is open source. Uh, so, you know, it's posted up on GitHub. So, you know, you can actually look through, uh, essentially the operating system of this thing, and it's essentially like, I don't know, like maybe a few thousand lines of assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it interesting was just like the organization of some of the files. You have a few files in there, it's like 1.s, 2.s, 3.s, <laughs> and there's a base file that imports them all together. Yeah, let's see, init, uh, there's save, there's read. 
which I'm guessing are like disc utilities. You save is for saving to your cassette disc. Saves to cassette one or two. So, uh, what is it? Yeah, kernel.s. And it's essentially like all the includes. Mm -hmm, exactly, yep. <laughs> fun times. You know what else is fun? World of Goo. Uh, so, World of Goo is a game that's like, uh, let's see, over 10 years old, 11 years old or so. Like, I remember, uh, it was, I think it was like in some design class, or maybe it was like some game, uh, like intro to game development class, that like suddenly everyone was playing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, you know, it's, a, it is a pretty fun game. Uh, and it was later in the Humble Indie Bundles. Uh, so the guy behind it decided that since, like, since it runs at 800 by 600, let's give this a little bit of an upgrade to HD. You know, after, you know, after I'm not sure how many years after mm -hmm. HD Duck got popular. <laughs> so it is now a 16 by 9 ratio as opposed to the original... 4x3. Uh, so, yeah, and also a few improvements uh, to help modding. Uh, like, no more encrypted assets or save files. And the config user TXT file is located with the save games. I know. It's, it's more fun when they put things out in the open so you can see what's going on and stuff. And to loop back to Microsoft, Solitaire has been inducted into the World Video Game Hall of Fame. Uh... So, yes, the solitaire that comes with Windows is... Sense in, forever. <laughs> yes. Is, uh, well, up until Windows 8.1. So, yeah, it's has the criteria that, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame looks for. Influence, longevity, uh, reach, and icon status. I mean, it literally has an icon. So it has an icon status. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's. I guess it's just been overlooked, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just always been there. Yep. All right. Uh, so if you have any feedback for the show, go ahead and submit it on thenexus.tv uh, or on Reddit. Uh, we have, uh, we're all on Reddit now, apparently. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your Microsoft, all your Solitaire, and all your uh, goo, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that seems to be about it. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that, uh, I'm making sort of like a to-do app in HTML. Oh. So, so yeah, I've been, since, like, work has been extremely slow, I'm like, hey, I want to, like, brush up on some JavaScript here. So, there you go. as much as I loathe JavaScript, it is kind of useful in certain situations. Maybe I'll have that... A, a more feature complete uh, next time. With that, I guess uh, have a good one. You too.